progressed in what it does was my mother and my father and my educator and my doctor and got me the job that I got and did everything that's ever that gave me a chance in life. The foster care situation, I think, was was uh, was nice. I mean, I mean, uh, there were people. Everybody was everybody was caring. It was a very beautiful thing because the Jewish community, um, through, in giving me um, a loan, reached out to me in a very real way. Um, I was in need and wanted to complete my education, and um, education was an a important family value and an important uh, Jewish value. From the very beginning of the Jewish presence in the New World, our admission was contingent on taking care of our own. In the 17th century, the intolerant director general of New Amsterdam, Peter Stuyvesant, wanted to expel the Jews. But the West India Company refused his petition with these words, dated April 26, 1655. These people may live and remain here, providing the poor among them shall not become a burden to the community, but be supported by their own nation. The Jewish community did not need such a directive to be aware of the need to help our less fortunate brothers and sisters. Taking care of our own has always been part of our heritage. It is our duty and our legacy to future generations. You're not only helping one person, one family at this generation, but you're helping down the line people who will be able to help others, which to me is the highest form of Jewish tzedakah. Tzedakah is the fulfillment of one's obligation to help other human beings. What they do is the highest level of giving. They apportion funds to people to help them move on and live a better life. And there are no names connected with this except that it came through this agency. And that's just about the highest level of giving, according to Maimonides. As the United States grew, so did the Jewish population, and so did our spirit of tzedakah, with the rise of Jewish organizations to provide assistance to the needy. This is the story of one such organization, one that is unique in its efforts as a regional agency, spanning 18 communities in five states one that has gone through three distinct missions with one overriding goal, to help our young people become independent, secure members of our community. A Jewish Educational Loan Fund is a, a living tribute uh, to the vitality that an agency can have uh, when it is uh, staffed and uh, governed by people who think in terms of moving with the times instead of trying to fight them or giving up. Our work began 118 years ago, and to a large degree, our story is told by the people involved in our organization's programs. The recipients, providers, supporters, the staff, and those who have played several roles. So the combination of having quality uh, community people with concern and then also hitting on a real need uh, has certainly kept it through 118 years and I suspect it'll continue on hopefully for another 118 years. We began as the Hebrew Orphans Asylum founded by Gate City Lodge of B'nai B'rith in 1876. It was part of a national network of orphanages for Jewish children sponsored by B'nai B'rith across the United States. We offered a haven to children in the organization's fifth district, from Florida, north through Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. From the day our doors opened in March 1889, 
we helped children who'd fled Europe's pogroms, as well as poverty and other family tragedy. My father died when I was 10, and my mother had taken critically ill with tuberculosis. In, in 1918 and 1919, there was an epidemic of tuberculosis, and at that day and time, you didn't recover from tuberculosis. You were sent away to die. And my mother was sent to Asheville, North Carolina, where uh, to a sanitarium for tubercular patients. And there was nowhere for us to go. So w our relatives were poor, and they put us, took us to the orphan's home. As a baby, I think I was passed around uh, because nobody, you know, my mother had to go to Asheville. And my father used to travel on the road, I believe. And uh, he, they had no one to leave me with. And so I went to uh, an, an aunt's house, and she uh, kept me as a baby, I think, for a little while. And then um, I don't think they could handle it. I don't know where else I went. And then I went to live with a cousin, uh, my uncle's daughter, who lived in Gainesville, Georgia. She was a newlywed, had no children at the time. So I stayed with her until I was able to get into the home. I'd like to add that I am glad that I was there for those years that I was there. That, uh, that, that helped me so much to be there with a group of the children. It was like a family that way. We all stuck together. We would slip down, down the hill and eat these locusts. They were brown, long brown. Over the years, hundreds of children side. called the orphanage their home. Uh, my uh, mother became very ill. In fact, she had TB, and uh, she was sent out to Denver, where she passed away. Uh, there were, there were, I had three brothers and two sisters at the time, and my father couldn't take care of us, so they put us in an orphan's home, a Protestant orphan's home in Jacksonville. And I think I was there, of course, I don't know, two or three years, but when they decided, I guess, that there was a Jewish orphan's home in Atlanta, that they were going to send all of us boys, all the, my three brothers and myself, to Atlanta. I was nine years old. My father had uh, died. It was 1919. My mother had seven children, the oldest of which was 14 and I was right in the middle, and she was unable to take care of us. So they were able to get three of us into the orphanage. I and uh, two twin brothers who were a couple of years younger than I. The orphanage stretched an entire city block along Washington Street between Little and Love Streets and the children who lived there were to be treated like everyone else, even though they were called inmates. They attended neighborhood public schools. They received religious training at the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation, now the Temple, and at Avath Occam Synagogue. The home offered after-school classes in typing, stenography, plumbing, and printing. Some orphans went on to college, Despite such opportunities, it was still an institution. I was always sort of ashamed of the fact uh, that when I was at school, everybody knew I was from the orphan's home. And uh, I felt a little, little bad about that. Uh, when I, the first pair of long pants, for instance, that I, they gave me after I got confirmed, someone had donated some burlap. Uh, and uh, if I remember, I think Lowe's a uh, manufacturing company made some pa long pants for a few of us fellows out of the burlap. And uh, the first, I was so proud of it. Uh, uh, when I went to school, some kid said to me, who died and left you those pants? And we would march up to breakfast, and one of the things that might be interesting is before we went to any meal, our shoes had to be shined, and we had to take our nails and show them that they had been cleaned. We'd have to wash our face and hands, and they would check our nails before each meal to see that we were clean before we went to the meals. 
While the orphanage stood as a tribute to the efforts of the entire region, it was a triumph to Jewish leadership, Jews mainly of German origin. Essentially, the German Jews wanted to make it clear that Jews took care of their own, that they would not be a burden on society. They were well-educated, they were active business people, they were essentially representative of the upper middle class. Uh, and what these people were geared towards was the most professional activities in American history, not American Jewish history, but in American social services at the time. These were Jews with professional and business ties to the non-Jewish community, with an interest in keeping those links intact. These people did not want lawlessness. They wanted an educated clientele here. They wanted social control, again, because of the image with the secular community. And this seems very cold-blooded. It seems very calculating. And that was part of it. But it also was a sense of these were fellow Jews, and they would take care of their own. The asylum became known as the Hebrew Orphans' Home after the institution split from B'nai B'rith. We didn't have excellent food, we didn't have nice clothes, but we got an education. The only thing I didn't have was love, but can't have everything. I do agree that that was the best place we could have been, because I think we would not have uh, come along and no telling what would have happened to us if we had not gone there. There was no other place for us to go. The experience that you had, whether it's enjoyable or not, is not the bottom line. The bottom line is what it really did for you. The strict bringing up that we were uh, given there stood us in good stead. The orphanage not only served needy Jewish children, it also served the Atlanta Jewish community. And we had an athletic club at that time <coughs> called the AYA, and we used to play baseball and football and basketball, and we played out at the home. My mother did all of her sewing at the orphan home when, with her sewing club. Carolyn Has Khan recalls her father's Sunday morning meetings to oversee the home's investments. He was picked up at 11 o'clock and, and left home to see about these properties, to invest the money. The orphanage also became the major Jewish charity to support in the Southeast in the early 20th century. The minute books list contributions, large and small. This, this is the minutes of 1923. I, Berman, well, I, Berman, was Israel Berman, my grandfather. The next was Mrs. S. Berman. Well, that's Sarah Berman, my grandmother. Uh, right on down, I. Macy, that was my uncle. Uh, L. Weiner, my father, dollar. S. Weiner, my uncle, Sam Weiner, a dollar. And uh, think of all of these people, and I've said that uh, uh, people who've contributed, uh, Jews in Georgia, from uh, Tybee, from the sea, seashore of Tybee to the mountains of Dalton and all over, uh, Rochelle, Georgia, Rome, Georgia, this is Jewish Southern history. When it arrived, I was flipping through it, and I was reading through the numbers and not really noticing any of, of the names where the, the money's come from. But there was one that stuck out that, that certainly caught my attention, and it was uh, my grandfather's uncle, whose name was the same as my own, Edward Montag, and his fund probably established a hundred years ago or, or uh, further back than that, has now become a, a reasonable contributor to the overall um, Jewish education loan fund. We closed the orphanage in 1930. All of our charges were placed with relatives or in religious Jewish foster homes. The idea was that a family uh, background was better for the child than just a group home with uh, peers and a, an overall superintendent, that the idea of the one-to-one -one relationship that took place within a family was more important and uh, in every way from a nurturing standpoint. 
So that was the move, and it wasn't only exclusively in Atlanta or in the southeastern region of the B'nai B'rith setup <coughs> that that was done. That was all over the country. At the same time, many cities in the southeast formed Jewish federations and family service divisions. Both took responsibility for direct services to Jewish children. The Holocaust brought a new wave of European orphans to our doors. We helped arrange foster care and education for these displaced youngsters. Benjamin Hirsch was among those Jewish children whose names appeared in the New York Times in a plea to save him from the Nazis. My uh, mother had a cousin who was a rabbi in Rome, Georgia, Dr. Rabbi Selig Auerbach. He saw the ad in the New York Times, and he went to Atlanta to get some help. I mean, he was, he was a, a rabbi in, in a small community, and he was barely making enough to sustain his own family. So uh, while he could vouch for, for being a relative of ours, uh, he certainly couldn't vouch for upkeep. The organization, still known as the Hebrew Orphans Home, placed Benjamin with different families as his needs changed. Our staff kept up with his progress. Uh, and Ms. Fink was, uh, I have very fond memories of her. She was, uh, uh, I think she may have been taken over from Ms. Weil, I'm not sure, but she was a very uh, caring person. You could tell that she, uh, that she had sp special care for individuals as when she spoke to them. When she spoke to me, I felt she was talking to me and she cared about what my problems were. In 1948, the organization officially became the Jewish Children's Service. In that role, we began prodding communities we long served to take a larger role in caring for children with problems. We helped establish new local programs, such as help for unwed pregnant women, residential treatment for emotionally disturbed children and adoptions. Dr. Joseph Patterson was chief physician of Eggleston Children's Hospital in Atlanta for 35 years and directly involved with the adoptions. What little work there was to be done with these babies, I examined them <clears throat> and if they got, became ill, uh, took care of them and so forth. I was glad to do it. I, it. Not only did it for the agency, I did it for a lot of people without money and uh, so forth. So we made house calls. We were different kinds of doctors in those days. By 1960, the Jewish Children's Service arrived at a crossroads. A survey conducted by the Council of Jewish Federations and Welfare Funds and the Child Welfare League of America suggested the organization discontinue all direct services. Uh, it was a very difficult time to justify continuation of the agencies unless this, this strong board really believed that they ought to be, that, that we had to do something to, to carry on. Several prominent community leaders proposed that the JCS be abolished as an independent regional agency and its resources be transferred to the then Atlanta Jewish Welfare Fund, now the Federation. Instead, funds from our endowment became seed money to support services in several member cities. The JCS sponsored the Charleston, South Carolina Jewish Social Service Agency, a community that had none until JCS stepped in. Charleston's Nat Shulman, Long the executive director of the Charleston Jewish Federation, will never forget JCS for helping with the study that concluded the region needed the outreach service. Mr. Shulman also recalls how former JCS executive director Ethel Copeland made a difference when a Charleston family could not care for their mentally retarded child. We call upon Miss Copeland and told her the situation and she came to Charleston and she took the child with her to Atlanta where the child was placed in a foster home until such a time as the child was able to be placed in this agency in South Carolina. 
In Atlanta, the JCS co-founded the Family Life Education Program, an inspiring series of lectures on timely topics of concern, drugs, intermarriage, the generation gap, and we help send emotionally handicapped children to camp throughout the region, a program that continues with a grant to the Very Special People program of the Atlanta Jewish Community Center. To this day, our organization supports one developmentally disabled adult, a foster child who no one would adopt in her infancy. But Eli Fun was a social worker who directed the agency then, and his uh, focus was to identify new um, programs and try to see how they would uh, how they would uh, survive, how they would uh, adhere to the local communities where he was trying to set them up when he, uh, when he brought them to those communities. So there were a variety of programs that he has tried to establish. And um, unfortunately, many of them did not, uh, did not succeed. Uh, the one program that did succeed very well was this educational uh, loan fund. We began to see a need in the community. We began to see increasing costs of college tuition. We began to see decreasing scholarship aid and particularly a decrease in aid for those students who were not highly gifted. And JELF requires simply that its students do adequate passing work. We do not require stars. The interest-free student loan program has given a hand and hope to many. Dr. Henry Siegelson came from Augusta, Georgia. You wonder how, how does a thousand dollars a year make a difference, but uh, state schools are inexpensive and I had some gifts from relatives and I worked and I uh, borrowed some more money from the state and I uh, went to medical school. I look back at this picture as one of the, the great days of my life. and. Uh, and I also think back to the people that gave me loans and the Jewish Children's Service Fund that, that enabled me to, to graduate from medical school, has enabled me to uh, uh, help society, to deliver medical care, to earn a good living and take care of my children. And I can't do more than that. We also made a difference to attorney Lynn Borsick. Not only is she a loan recipient, she's a member of the committee that reviews loan applications. But this really cemented, uh, or helped to cement, a commitment on my part. Um, and I want to give back to the community in lots of ways. And serving on this committee um, makes me very proud. George Washington was my first choice before that. Uh -huh. And what, what made that difference? Local organizations administer the program in the 18 communities we serve. JELF has been really a godsend to oh students God, yeah. in our community. But we're talking about the neediest of the needy here. People f without this $750 or $1,000 or $1,200 would not be able to go to college. JELF <laughs> is making the dream of a college degree a reality for Matthew and Allison Hesch. Their father died when they were children. Their mother does all she can, but can't help with college costs. Matthew majors in biology at the University of Miami and has his sights set on medical school. I have to work no matter what because I receive a college work-study award. And if it wasn't for JELF, I'd have to work 60 to 80 hours a week to fill in the gaps, which is ridiculous because right now I work, I work nights. And that's the only type of job I could have because during the day I'm in lab all day long and performing experiments and basically without JELF I there would there would be no way I could I could pull this all off and still get the grades I get and be awarded the uh, the options I'm going to have in the future. Allison, a dancer, is majoring in psychology. I do have some sort of uh, a scholarship here because I'm an honor student so they help me out a little bit but it still isn't enough. Books are very expensive JELF helps me with that. All my school supplies, I mean, there's no way that I could have afforded that myself. And when you go through these applicants and you read the family situations, the home involvement, uh, down here, the situation after Hurricane Andrew, 
with many families having lost their businesses, having had deaths in their families. It's, it's really very, uh, uh, just a very heart-wrenching experience. And the board involvement in it, we all just want to whip out our checkbooks and write a check ourselves. So Jelf is doing a tremendous job. Throughout the communities we serve, individuals who believe in our efforts are keeping the loan programs alive. Donna and Jerry Weiss support the loan fund in South Florida through the Family Foundation, named for Donna's father. Well, since I was physically able to meet with the students, hear what they wanted to do, and know that my loan helped make a difference in their life, that is so satisfying. Anything that a, a foundation can do that becomes personal becomes satisfying. It's not like giving to a large charity where you're not really sure who the recipient of that dollar is. Okay, this is the process continues as the Educational Loan Fund Application Review Committee considers each request. B. Feynman co-chairs the committee. We have a representative from each community we serve and we try to get people from different um, vocational backgrounds uh, that can look at each applicant in a different way. Psychologists, doctors, lawyers, teachers. The process that I go through is I've read the, the standards and the criteria, um, then I read the student's brief, um, figure out you know whether or not it's somebody that I think um, qualifies, um, and if so, is it the full amount, is it a partial amount, or is it somebody who doesn't qualify at all? Um, and then you give the reasons. Um, and the input that comes in, uh, you know, by and large, if you did it cut and dry by just looking at percentages, most of the time people agree with you. Uh, when they don't, I've found nine times out of ten it's a darn good reason. Judy Wallman co-chairs the Loan Review Committee. She was also a loan recipient from Charleston. Any student that we've actually funded in the past is a priority. Um, once we've made a commitment, we do like to fulfill that commitment to that student as long as the conditions remain the same. Um, with new students, what we look for is, first of all, to see that they have done everything that they can um, with pursuing their college education. To number one, uh, we give preference to in-state, choices in in-state schools. Um, if a student has chosen an out-of-state school, we look to see if the package that they've been offered actually makes the school the same cost as an in-state school. And because um, our feeling is that our goal is not to make sure that kids go to the best school necessarily, but to get a, a quali quality college education. And we look to see that the student has put together as many um, sources of uh, income as they can, different loans, different scholarships, um, that their own contribution is reasonable, that they've put out some effort to work and put some money towards that, that the family has made this a sacrifice to. And we view the Jewish Education Loan Fund as that final piece that helps to make the college education possible. The Jewish Educational Loan Fund is there when students have nowhere else to go, whether it's for undergraduate, graduate, technical, or vocational schools. I remember when I was a kid, my father used to tell me, you can lose everything you have in life, but you can't use, lose your education. And with your education, you can rebuild. And that's why I think this committee is so important. We have changed as the needs of our children and young Jewish adults have changed. And we have been there whenever they needed our help. Back in 1979, I think it was, when the Shah of Iran was over turn overthrown. Um, we had a special situation. Um, at that time we had a lot of Iranian students here and their parents couldn't get money to them and without the money to pay for their college tuition they would have had to go back to Iran which would have been extremely dangerous for them personally. And so um, the board of the Jewish Educational Loan Fund allotted a special amount to help 
these students through school. We have responded with each new wave of immigration of Jews in need. We are currently helping many Jewish students who came from the former Soviet Union. And since no one knows for sure what the future may bring, we will be there. We had some very uh, sad situations where uh, families um, had endured serious medical problems or parents been, had died, students were left alone. But when you see a, a, a 18, 21 year old child who has no parents, no source of income, nothing. You know, it's one thing to go to Georgia State on the cheapest tuition possible and get some help, but where does a child eat? And once they're past 18, uh, where do they get the money? It is really, really pitiful. I guess the most pitiful was the father deserts them and you don't see them. And I, One of my pet peeves is when you say a couple gets divorced, and I can understand that. But how does a person divorce their children? You know, that's hard. That's hard. So, you know, thank goodness we're here to help. Each year, we award approximately 100 loans to new and repeat loan recipients. Each loan averages about $1,100 per student each year. Approximately $1 million is either going out as loans to students or is awaiting repayment. And we do have a wonderful reputation in that most of our loan recipients do pay back the money. And that gives us an opportunity to go ahead and loan it on to other people who need it as well. The intake that is done when someone comes to the caseworker at the agency that does the intake, and this has been established by the, by the GELF board, the whole form, and it's given to them, these are the things we want you to talk about. These are the, this is the information we have to know. But we also want you to explain to the loan recipient a bit of the history of this agency. So when we loan them that money, they understand where it comes from and the feelings of the people who amassed this money for them to receive as an interest-free loan. The same feeling of partnership has kept our past presidents actively involved. Some of our leaders remain dedicated for life. We're still trying to repay our debt. We'll never get it repaid. We repaid the $1,780 that they lent me to go to college. And then we've been repaying our debt with ever since then, and we still haven't got it paid off. But part of my payment was my son becoming active. The Garbers are one of several families with more than one generation involved and supportive of our work. Steve, like his father, served as president and is currently chairman of the board. His wife, Mary Ann, has been active on the loan committee, among other activities. And we, we've talked about it to our kids. So it's, if you talk about Jewish values, Lador Vador, the notion of generation to generation here, um, uh, it, it's an object lesson for us. It's a, it's a real values lesson that, uh, as Dad has said, it's not like um, you're doing anything for extra credit. It's never any extra credit. It's only in that sense of going back and doing something that's in keeping with what's already been done for you. Jennings and Jill Hertz and their family also support and actively take part in our efforts. Both Jill and their daughter, Patty Reed, are board members. Jill also serves as secretary, while Patty sits on the loan committee. And to this day, some non-Jewish individuals also have seen our goal as theirs. People like Roy Day, a partner in Al Garber's accounting firm. I got a letter from a lawyer in Florida which said, Mr. Roy Day has passed away and has left the Jewish Children's Service, which was the name he knew it and audited it under, one-fourth of his estate, which came to $70,000, period. Now, 
I think it might have been 5% because of me, but it was 95% because of what he saw the good that was being done. The Simon Wolf Endowment Fund, begun nearly a century ago, receives and holds all individual contributions, special tributes, gifts, bequests, legacies, named funds, estates, and loan repayments. It began with a pool of about $100,000. With the help of investment advisor Kerry Coplin of Wertheim, Schroeder and Company, the fund has grown to more than $2 million. Uh, he takes his guidance from the investment committee and we get monthly statements plus he will give us written reports during the year uh, to tell us what's happening and at any time we ask him he'll also update us on telephone or in writing. He's done a marvelous job for us. Still, only the interest income from the Simon Wolf Endowment Fund supports the loans. With college costs heading higher, more students are asking for our help, and they are asking for greater sums of money. We hope we can meet those needs. Maybe at some point down the road we'll be able to give larger amounts um, to more widespread group of deserving students. Uh, college costs are escalating. I mean, I, I don't even know how some of our middle-income families are going to afford it pretty soon. We may face even greater challenges in the future. We will be there. Pidion Shavuyim, the redemption of the captives, is a commandment that supersedes all other obligations. Why? Because in Jewish history, We've had many occasions when many of our people were capt captives, sold into slavery. And saving a human life is the most basic and most important commandment that we have. Charity in Judaism is, as you know, tzedakah. What is the root of tzedakah? Tzedek. Justice, righteousness, responsibility. Tzedek, tzedek, tildof, the Bible says. Always pursue justice. Always pursue the responsibility that you have to one another because Jewish need will never cease to be. Need is something that is inherent in, in human life. And when need is, is there, the educational fund, which pro provides a basis for people to establish themselves, I think this is one of the most sacred and most important projects that we can be part of. I am happy to have been come to Atlanta in 1929-28, and I saw the orf orphans' home in operation. I was there a few times, but now as I see what it what it's produced, the educational fund, and I know so many people who have benefited therefrom. I say that. These people who are active in it, and to you, Al Garber especially, my yarmulke off to you. God bless you. God bless you. Continue this work, and may all of us join with you in this sacred undertaking. From the Hebrew Orphans' Home to the Jewish Children's Service to the Jewish Educational Loan Fund, 118 years and counting. We have grown, changed, and grown some more. We make a difference, one life at a time.